So let's go through the fundamentals of digital imaging. First of all, what is a digital image? So in this case, our image is being recorded as, as a numerical array of pixels. So though we're seeing an image, it's actually essentially an Excel spreadsheet. Each pixel has two different characteristics defined. First is its size or its equivalent size in the image. And in this example, you can see uh, that the pixel has a size of 100 nanometers. And we also have a gray level, uh, which is our intensity value. And in this case, we have an intensity value of 108. So the two characteristics, characteristics we're looking at here are sampling resolution and also bit depth. So what is bit depth? It's basically the number of grayscale values that we're going to split up each individual pixel into. So what intensity ranges there are. So in a 1-bit image, you've got 2 to the power of 1, which gives you two colors. Uh, this means there's either zero intensity or maximum intensity. And this is what we call a binary image. And we'll use those uh, in the Fiji for quantification workshop. For a 2-bit image, that gives us four to the, uh, sorry, 2 to the 4 grayscale values, which is going to give us uh, four gray levels. 3-bit is 2 to the 3, which gives us eight gray values. And then 4-bit is 2 to the 4, which gives us 16 gray values, etc, etc. What does this mean? So here we've got a zoomed in region of uh, 2 by 4 pixel arrays. And on the image on the left, this is saved on an 8-bit scale, which goes from 0 to 255 uh, grayscale values. And you can see the two pixels which have been highlighted have the exact same intensity values. If we take the exact same data, but we save that as a 16-bit image, then you can see we can now start to differentiate the intensities between these two pixels. And that really becomes important when we start to look quantitatively at the, at the data. Another example of this I thought uh, we could use is to take an actual microscope image and present that as a 1-bit image. So either zero intensity or maximum intensity, a 2-bit image, 3-bit image and a 4-bit image and then finally an 8-bit image and you can see that at each of these steps we're seeing more and more information. If we now take a line profile and look at the intensity along that yellow line in the image and this is again one of the things we'll do in the Fiji for quantification workshop we can see that as the bit depth increases again we're getting a lot more quantitative information uh, so in the one bit image, you can see it's either zero or 255. By the time we get to the eight bit, you can see a lot of information going on. So uh, how does that equate to microscopes? So uh, a lot of the detectors that we're using can come if they're, for example, a camera based detector, they'll have a set uh, bit depth. So you'll often hear people talking about a 12-bit camera. Uh, if you're using a confocal system, then we can actually sometimes change the bit depth that we're recording the, the data at. So as I already mentioned, one bit image is giving us two grayscale values. That's using uh, creating a binary mass that we can use for image analysis. A lot of common microscope detectors are 8 bits, which gives us 256 grayscale values. But you can go up, as you see, up to 32-bit images, uh, which is giving us uh, well over 4 billion grayscale values, which is probably more information than you really need. The take-home message here is if you're just uh, taking an image for visualization purposes, you know, for putting in a presentation, then 8-bit is probably fine. If you're going to do any quantification, then you might want to increase that bit depth up to something like 12 or 16-bit uh, the only difference it's going to make is the size of your file, so it shouldn't take any longer to acquire the data. Image acquisition. So we can spend all the time trying to take the most perfect picture and then something comes out of nowhere and ruins it for us. So what are we trying to do when we're generating digital images? So what we're trying to do is get the best representation of what we're seeing down the eyepiece in our actual image. Now the rule is, if you put crap in, you should get crap out. 
unfortunately if you know what you're doing or conversely not don't know what you're doing with microscopy uh, setups you can make data that looks pretty crap look pretty good or data that looks pretty good look pretty crap so uh, some rules to try and look at is to not use offset on your raw data so offset is a setting where you can clip the lower end uh, intensity values from your image uh, you should set your ranges that you're acquiring your data on using both positive and negative controls. And if you want to be able to compare the data, then acquire each different set with the exact same settings. And one really important thing is to do a pilot analysis before and during your imaging. So am I getting the data that I want from my actual experiment? Once we've acquired our data, we can look at it um, on something called an intensity graph. So we've got two examples of an intensity graph here. Uh, on the x-axis, we're looking at the intensity. So you can see the uh, intensity graph on the top is running from 0 to 255 grayscale values. That's an 8-bit image. And the one below is going from 0 to 65,000. That's a 16-bit image. Uh, and on the uh, y-axis, what we're looking at is the number of pixels with that intensity. So over here, this is the lower end, this is the black background within your image, and the further we stretch out up here, these are the brighter sections within your, within your image. Now it's really key when we're acquiring our data that we avoid saturating the detector. So we want to be able to quantify and visualize everything that's uh, captured on the on the image. Uh, and a lot of microscopes nowadays have uh, intensity range indicators or special lookup tables, which will show you when you're hitting saturation. So on this example here, we've got red pixels showing up. And also in the histogram, you can see over here that the data is hitting that maximum value as well. What we ideally want is an image that doesn't have saturated data. And again, you can see that within the histogram that it's not hitting this maximum value. If we are get, getting saturation, how can we deal with that? Well, we can decrease the excitation percentage, so how much light we're putting on to excite our fluorophores. We can decrease the camera exposure time if we're using a camera-based system. Or we can do things like increase the scan speed if we're using a confocal or decrease the gain if we're using a confocal or a camera that has, has a gain setting on it. Next thing, if you remember, we were talking about um, our pixels have a set size, uh, and that's because when we're creating a digital image, we're creating what we call a raster image. So our image is broken up and the intensities are assigned into these pixels. This means that that sampling is set so if you try and zoom in on this little blue duck it's only ever going to get more pixelated uh, so that's the raster image the vector image on the right is something that you might create in something like photoshop uh, this is where all of these curves and angles are um, mathematical formula so if you zoom into them then they will scale and won't become pixelated so the key thing is when we're Taking our microscopy images, we're generating a raster image, we're setting those pixel dimensions at the time of acquisition. So the question is, what size should our pixels be when we're trying to capture that data? So what we're going to do is we're going to take our blue duck and we're going to divide it up into pixels. And then your job is to try and work out at which point you're happy that you can see a blue duck. Now normally I ask for a show of hands in our workshops, but it's going to be a bit difficult in this case. But hopefully no one can think that they can see a blue duck in the 3x3 three three frame size here. By the time you get to 5x5, five five, then you might have a little hint. By the time you get to 10x10, ten ten, then you're probably a little bit more certain that that's an actual blue duck that is being represented in the digital image. And by the time you get to 20x20, 20 and we're pretty sure that we've got a blue duck. But what now if the question is, can you count how many eyes there are on the blue duck? Would you be able to surely tell me that that was one or two eyes that you can visualize in that image? In that case, you might need to sample slightly differently. So the really key thing before you start 
to acquire your data is try and think what analysis do I want downstream from this? What information do I really need? And then we can try and set the sampling to match uh, the information that you're going to need downstream. <clears throat> so unfortunately this is covered by some mathematics. So this is called the Nyquist rate or the nyquist shannon sampling rate. And what this says is basically to optimally represent an analog signal in digital space, the analog signal needs to be sampled at least 2.3 times. Uh, we've shown this in this little um, these waves. So the blue wave is our analog signal, and the red line is our digital sampling of them. So at 0.83x, you can see that our red line is not representing the analog signal, the blue line. By the time we get to 1.3x, we're getting closer, but again, we're probably not there. In this case, we'd call this undersampled. By the time we get to 2.3x, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. By the time you get to 10x, it looks much, much better, but in this case, we're probably oversampled. So 2.3x is the magic number. I can't do that math, so I always round it up to 3. Um, so basically, if you know the structures you're interested in, to sample it correctly, you need to divide the size of that structure by 3. The downside with oversampling is if you're on a confocal, it's going to take a long time to acquire that data. Okay, so fortunately there are online calculators which allow us to, to calculate uh, these numbers and also a lot of the acquisition softwares now have an optimum button which also allows you to set your sampling rate correctly, so your pixel sizes correctly to get the best resolution. The table that I've uh, put up on this slide shows the recommended pixel dimensions if you take the theoretical axial resolution and divide that by 2.3. So if you look at the bottom, for example, the 63x and the 100x objectives, which have a 1.4 NA um, resolution. So if you remember, numerical aperture is what's giving you the resolution of the, of the system. In the green channel, you're looking at 60 nanometers uh, pixel sizes to get the best possible resolution out of that microscope. Now there are a couple of caveats here. First of all, it's working off a theoretical axial resolution, and that assumes a perfect optical system. Let me reassure you that your microscope is not perfect. Um, so I'd be suggesting somewhere in the order of 60 to 80 nanometers if you want to sample correctly to get the best possible resolution on a microscope with a 1.4 NA objective. Obviously, if you're using super resolution techniques, then this would also change the pixel sizes that you need. The other thing to bear in mind is this is only if you need the best possible resolution. If you're counting nuclei, then pixel sizes of 60 nanometers is dramatically oversampling what you actually need. Okay, next up are basic rules of digital imaging. So first thing is when you're saving your data, always save it under the raw file extension. So if you're working on a Leica system, that would be .lif or .lei. If you're with Zeiss, .lsm or .czi, etc., etc. Now the reason we do this is because it doesn't just save the image, but it also saves what we call metadata. So uh, information about exactly what the microscope settings were on that day when you took that experiment. The other nice thing about this is a lot of the softwares also allow you to reuse those settings again on another day. Um, so you can be imaging the exact same way many, many uh, days, weeks, or months apart. Second thing, if you're going to export your data out, then please export it in the TIFF file format because this again uh, keeps the original information for any downstream quantitative analysis that you're doing. The issue with using things like JPEG, GIF, or PNG is that very often they use what's called a, a lossy compression, um, which actually means that you lose information. So if you can see the two images here, the one on the right is kind of a bit more uh, averaged out. So there's a little bit less information going on in this image than there is in the TIFF image. So you can still use these for things like PowerPoint or for uh, printing things out for, present, uh, for uh, your lab book. 
Um, but if you're doing any quantitative analysis, then we recommend you save the images as a TIFF file. Okay, number three, modification. So never process or modify on your raw files. Always make sure that you keep a copy. And for every modification you make, save a different file. Have something in the file name which makes it obvious what modifications you've made at that point. Someone should be able to come in, look at your data and work out what steps you've taken. Uh, last, uh, next thing is make sure that you're backing up your data. So uh, your supervisor has signed an agreement with the funding body who funds their research that they're going to ethically look after their data. Um, so they've got an agreement saying that you're going to doubly back up your data, you're going to keep data for something like five years after publication. Um, so don't ever use the microscope computer as a safe place to store your data. You, there are instances where there are hundreds of people accessing those computers and they can either accidentally or deliberately delete that data off. I also suggest that you don't keep all of your data on an external hard drive. We've had a case in the past where someone's lost their hard drive with six months worth of work on it and the only way of getting that work back was to go back and do all that work again. Um, you don't want to be in that situation. Okay, next thing is, as I've already mentioned, although it looks like an image, it's actually an Excel spreadsheet of values, so your image is actually scientific data. So if you're trying to make the image look more beautiful, you're actually manipulating the data. Now, hopefully nobody would go into an Excel spreadsheet and start randomly changing numbers. And you can no longer get away with saying, oops, I thought that'd be okay, or I wasn't aware of this. Um, so you really have to be careful and treat your scientific data ethically. And we'll take you through a few examples over the next few slides of what you should and shouldn't be doing. So on this example, on the left-hand side, we've got an original electron microscopy image. And on the right-hand side, we've got a manipulated image. So in electron microscopy, you can uh, detect proteins of interest using an antibody, which has an immune gold attached to the, to the antibody. And in this case, I guess these researchers think that these larger blobs here are their immune golds. And they've also got two species with different sizes, sorry, two different nanogold sizes. So they've gone in and they've increased the contrast on these structures that they think are their nanogolds. And they've got this weird blob going on here, so they've gone in and Photoshop and taken that out. Hopefully you guys can see that that's not ethical. They're making specific modifications to specific parts of the image. Next example is a fluorescence microscope image. In this case, we've got a group of cells. The image looks reasonably okay to me. There's a little bit of saturation in some of the points. But if you do a simple contrast adjustment, you can see that the cells in the bottom left-hand corner and the cell group of cells in the bottom right-hand corner have a different background to the rest of the image, which suggests that they've been cut and pasted in from another, another image. So again, this is obviously not ethical, but it's a very easy uh, step to do this type of analysis. And a lot of the journals now have editors whose jobs are going through and looking at this uh, in any submitted uh, uh, articles. Again, not ethical. <clears throat> Next one is modification on a specific feature. So in this case, we've got a fold up here in the left hand corner on the image and that's been taken out in the manipulated image. So again, not ethical, we're making a change to a specific feature within the image. There are a few ways we could get around this. So if the fold isn't sitting in an area which is important for the interpretation, we could just leave it there. It's always nice to see some realistic data in papers. Again, if it's not important to the interpretation, you could just crop it out and have a square around the region that is important for the interpretation. If it's vitally important, then you can always go back to the block and section out and try and get a try and get a section without a fold in the important region. 
in this case in our original image we've got a bit of a shaded area in the bottom right hand corner here it doesn't look like this microscope was aligned properly and in the manipulated image you can see that's been cleaned up so first thing is make sure your systems are working properly if this is a bump microscope for example please let us know if you're seeing issues like that and we'll try and sort them out for you uh, this would be acceptable only if no changes occur to the actual tissue and also a statement is made in the figure legend. Now, I would say that that's a given for any manipulations that you make. You must tell the reviewers and anyone reading exactly what you've done to, to the data. Last one is we've got our original image on the left. It's a bit of uneven illumination again and we've removed all of this background tissue as well. Again, not acceptable. We're taking a large degree of background alteration, um, even if it's clarified within the, within the text. Unethical. Okay, I quite like this experiment. So we've got a sample, which we're obviously interested in. We've got a positive and negative control, which hopefully have been used to set up the acquisition settings. But again, if we do a simple contrast adjustment, we can see that our negative control is completely black. Now, you will never get a completely black image off a microscope. You'll always have some kind of electronic noise from the detector, which, um, which contributes some intensity. And you can also see the background between the positive control and the sample are also different as well. So it may be that these images have either been acquired differently or have been treated differently in terms of visualization. So again, not ethical. <clears throat> so what can we do? So we can make a modification to the whole image. So we go back to the intensity graph in this case. And in this case, we've got an example of some data taken where we haven't used the whole dynamic range or majority of the information is down in this bottom left-hand corner here at the low intensity range. So what we can do is increase our maximum intensity uh, down towards where the data actually is to make this a bit brighter for visualization. So again I should stress this is visualization only not quantification. Uh, if you do this and hit apply you're going to rescale all of this information across the full, full range. So here we've rescaled it this is our, um, our lookup table showing a saturation. We don't have any red pixels here, uh, so we're not hitting the data. We're not saturating any of the, the details. Another example, if we go too far, so we've gone beyond where there's actually data. Now we can see saturation. And if you compare the structures down here to the ones above, you can see they're actually a lot larger, and that actually changes our interpretation of the, of the data. Okay, so you can adjust up until the point where you're starting to hit information but not beyond because we change the interpretation of the data. So that's misrepresented. Okay, so just to clarify, all image modifications must be ethical. We can adjust the minimum and maximum positions for visualization, not for quantification. Uh, do not just adjust gamma. Uh, so a lot of the times on these intensity graphs, you see these lines, this middle position, if we were to move this up or down, is uh, switching what we call gamma, which is a non-linear adjustment. Again, it's probably best if you uh, avoid that, if you can. And if you do make any differences, then please be descriptive in the methods sections of your publications. Okay, how are we going to go about presenting the data? So a lot of these have already been covered in the previous slides. I've taken this out of the journal Cells, Instructions to Authors. Uh, if you're thinking of publishing in a paper, it's always worth looking at their Instructions to Authors. Or if you're not planning to publish anytime soon, you can look at some of the papers that your lab has published in recently and look at their Instructions to Authors. So let's go through some of these. First of all, any alterations should be applied to the entire image. We've already covered that, right? We should clearly explain all alterations in the figure legend. 
we should only compare data that's appropriate to compare, e.g. data from the same experiment acquired the exact same way. And in cell, they're saying individual images should not be used in multiple figures unless the figures describe different aspects of the same experiment. So you can't duplicate figures within a single uh, publication. There's a couple of things uh, that are also key to, to think about. So be aware of color sensitivity and color blindness, and also be aware of printing issues as well. And we'll cover those last two points over the next few slides. So first of all, color. Most fluorescence detectors are monochrome, which means your images are usually grayscale. So any color that we're seeing is being converted from the grayscale into color using something called a lookup table. Uh, three of the most commonly used lookup tables are shown here, the blue, green, and red lookup table. And in this case, zero intensity is black, Maximum intensity is blue, and then we've got a linear scale between black and blue. Same for green, black to green, and green to red. <clears throat> okay, so color sensitivity. Our eyes have different numbers of uh, rods and cones, and we see light very differently. So I've taken the exact same image here, and I've pseudo-colored it using the blue lookup table, the green lookup table, and the red lookup table. Now most of you will probably see best in the green or red wavelengths, uh, in which case you'll probably see the most information uh, in these images in green or red, and not so well in the, in the blue channel. So again, you can change how people interpret your data depending on the color of the lookup table that you're using to present that data. Again, this is just a zoom in showing the same thing. Uh, when we look at our uh, microscopy images, so for example on a computer or if you're looking at it on your phone, then we're normally using what's called a red, green, blue color palette. So uh, the colors are coming through from a mixture of different pixels which are showing red, green, and blue. So for example, if you want to see red on a computer screen, then you have full intensity red, no green, no blue. That gives you red, right? All green, no red, and no blue gives you green. No red, no green, all blue gives you blue. If you have a mixture of red and green, then that's yellow. And if you have a mixture of red and blue, that's going to give you magenta. So as I say, if you're looking at anything digitally, we're using that RGB color palette. Now this is what we call an additive color palette. So we can add all these things together and get the different colors. If you add them all, you get white. When it comes to actually printing and presenting your data, for example, on a poster, um, then we use a different color palette. It's called the CMYK color palette. And that's what we call a subtractive color palette. So it works very differently to how you've set that data up uh, on your computer screen. Now, this is showing us all the different colors that are available. Um, and this triangle here shows us the RGB color palette. So if you guys have ever spent time setting up a nice uh, panel of fluorescence images and you've got some really nice green uh, channel uh, in, your, in your panel and then when you come to print it out, it looks a bit washed out, that's because the CMYK color palette can't spread out as far into the green as the RGB color palette. Okay, so again, it's not gonna be as clear as it will be on your screen. So this is a standard kind of um, fluorescence panel. We've got our nuclei in blue because biologists heads blow up if nuclei are anything other than blue. We've got a couple of other stains, one in green and red, and then we've got our merge showing the blue, green, and red. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, we see details differently in the different wavelengths. So how about we change how we present the data? Why don't we show it in a grayscale? In which case you're seeing all three channels the exact same way, and you can still put a merge over here with the, the multiple colors. Another thing which um, 
I've seen a lot of people using more recently is an inverted lookup table. So again, grayscale, but having the lower intensities white and the higher intensities black. And this is very useful for showing both low and high intensity information as well. It also saves a lot on ink if you're printing these things out at home. And then finally, is the color blindness consideration. So a large proportion of the population are red green color blind, so they can't really tell the difference between the green and the red channels in these RGB merges. Some potential uh, combinations that work better for them are something like cyan, yellow, and red, or cyan, yellow, and magenta, or my personal preference, which is blue, green, and magenta. So it's not that different to the traditional blue, green, red. You just have magenta instead of the, instead of the green. <clears throat> okay, so try and avoid those blue, green, red merges.